Hi, everyone that's joining us. We will be starting in just a few minutes. Welcome. Hey, guys. Hey, Stephanie. Long time no see. Beautiful day in Michigan. It's sunny. It's not too windy. It's like you the can't even believe time. it's January outside. Such a game changer to get a little bit of sun here. Right. As Maggie knows, I see Maggie on the list, a fellow Ann Arborite. Okay, we'll give it one more minute before we launch into our webinar. Um, welcome to everyone that's still joining us. Just hang tight with us for one more minute. Thanks for coming at the end of a long school day, guys. Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, some more people might be joining us throughout, but we'll go ahead and start. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first of three free webinars that we're hosting. Uh, we are Cherry Lake Publishing Group. My name is Julia, and I'm the head of marketing. I'm thrilled to be here with all of you today. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope most of you are familiar with us, but for those of you who may not be, we are an independent publishing company with imprints across school, library, and trade markets. Our imprints include Cherry Lake Press, Cherry Blossom Press, 45th Parallel Press, Torch Graphic Press, and Sleeping Bear Press. We're so excited today to be joined by our webinar facilitator, Kristen Fontario. Kristen is a clinical assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Information. She teaches um, courses in contextual inquiry and user needs assessment. Um, makerspace culture and tools, information literacy, and library and information science. She has many years of experience as a librarian herself, and we are proud to have her as one of our authors and curriculum developers for 21st Century Skills Innovation Library, Makers as Innovators. Um, following Kristen's presentation, my colleague Caitlin Sorrentau, who is one of our editors, will run through a curated list of our new titles that we think might be of interest to you and your students. We encourage you all to sign up for our next webinar, which will be on February 18th on the topic of getting a foot in the door, building curriculum bundles. We will be circulating the link for that in an email following the webinar, and we'll also host a third webinar on March 18th, and the topic for that one is being heard during COVID-19. Again, all of these webinars are free and curated towards school librarians. So without further delay, I'm going to hand it over to Kristen. Take it away. Thanks, guys. And what um, Julia didn't say, but I want to make sure gets heard, is she said that Lucy Calkins just endorsed the Cherry Blossom series um, for the very youngest readers, and I am in huge awe of Lucy Calkins. So congratulations, you guys. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and as you do, I hope you'll fire up this URL in your device, because I feel like today we need to have a conversation about sort of framing about where we go, and then we'll talk more about specifics in the sec, um, specific actions in the second session where we have a little bit more um, time to invest. And the first thing I wanna say besides that I love Lucy Calkins, uh, I am a clinical associate professor at the University of Michigan School of Information, and I am a former um, elementary school librarian, and so it's always a pleasure to be with my, my peeps again. And, um, the first thing I want to just say is like, take a deep breath. We have had a pretty traumatic start to 2021 and I am confident that that's playing out 
in weird and unusual ways in your workplace. And I also want to say that none of us have the answers. So if you're looking for a little workbook that has like 12 lessons, um, that isn't what today is about. Today is about working together because I think that as we pool our unique situations and our expertise, we're going to find some um, aha moments and some insights that really help us take things to the next, the next level in our own programs. So today I'm hoping we'll talk about these things. Where are we now? What are stakeholders worried about? What do we see that others might not see um, from our unique perspective and also in our unique role as not being um, a classroom teacher in the traditional sense? We'll talk a little bit about trends and thoughts of what I'm seeing and then uh, Caitlin will take over and do um, and talk about some new Cherry Lake materials that have come out um, which I'm really excited about. They're so beautiful. Okay, so where are we now? So first thing I want you to do is go to this URL and will you just stick your initial under the type of um, situation, both the type of schooling that you're doing right now and the age band that you are part of. So you'll notice at that URL, oh, I see some people in there already. It'll just help me get a sense of where we are. And by the way, just from a pedagogical stance, I'm a real fan of having, I think Zoom has some great tools built in for things like polling, but I find that having a Zoom deck and a, a Google Doc or a Google Slide deck can help me have more interactivity with folks. And I hope that you are finding similar hacks like this that are working for you. So it looks like we've got some elementary folks We'll do, sort of have the plurality, a couple of middle and high school folks. And I will say that Cherry Lake mostly goes up till about eighth grade with some high-low readers that go higher. So just keep that in mind as we go through. Um, and I, the first thing I want to say is that people like me who aren't in libraries every day, um, but spend a lot of time with school or public librarians, are noticing that you guys are doing incredibly adaptive and innovative work. And the awful thing is that there's a parallel that's happening. Even though we can see how much adapting and innovating you're doing, what we hear from practitioners is that they don't feel good about what they're accomplishing. And I just want you to have a moment to sort of catch your breath and, and think about that the enormous changes that you have made to your personal lifestyle, your professional lifestyle, the lives of your students that you maybe have not taken the time to sit and think about because we tend to be detail oriented people, we librarians. And so we tend to see what we've not done well. And I want you to have a moment to really think about all that you have overcome. And um, I see Stephanie's on this, this webinar. So this is from, uh, familiar to her, I know. There's this term called surge capacity that is, that is, has to do with how much kind of trauma we can deal with. And it's sort of a, a well of energy that we can call on in short-term stressful situations to survive. So things like natural disasters, people can kind of be superhuman for a day or two. And what this author, um, Tara Hell says is, yeah, you can have that energy like to get through the three days of a tsunami. But the reality is we have been in like an 11 month tsunami and we aren't equipped as human beings to continue to thrive at 100% under, um, under pandemics. And she described feeling <laughs> this, in her words, an anxiety tinted depression mixed with ennui that I can't kick. And I have talked to lots of you who are feeling that way. And if you're not, I'm really thrilled. I don't mean to put you in a box. Um, but this sense of like, I just can't get myself to the next step. And that is because we are going through this period where 
you know, our ability to deal with a short-term emergency has had to sustain itself over months and months and months. And for some of you, as you watch January or a new semester roll along, it just seemed almost unmountable, even though you're, you're totally used to it under normal circumstances. And Tara says in this article, why do you think you should be used to this by now? We're all beginners. It's a once in a lifetime experience. It's expecting a lot to think we'd be managing this really well. So give yourself some space and some humanity to realize that, that these are very weird times. Um, here is, I, people who know me know I love the FRED um, government data portal. Look at what's happened with unemployment, how we got lulled into years of unemployment falling and how rapidly it spiked. And even though it's come down, we're not back to normal. And if we think about the families and the, the children and the teachers that we work with, we know that some people are struggling with this very bottom level of need. Will they have food? Will they have shelter? Will they be able to be able to pay the electrical bill? And yet, what is the point of school but to get us to the top of the pyramid, which is this sense of self-actualization and the ability to, for children to grow into uh, healthy and high-functioning adults? And think about how some of the things in the middle of this pyramid, like friendship and and sense of connection are being strained in all populations in a school. And that's just assuming that all we were dealing with was a pandemic. And then we had January 6th, which no matter where you fell on the political spectrum was traumatic. And then we had the fears of the, the inauguration. I had a student yesterday who said, she couldn't watch the inauguration because she felt this ominous sense. Would everybody make it through the day alive? You know, that's not normal either, right? Um, and this article in, um, in the Elemental Page of Medium gives us some advice on ways in which we can get ourselves rejuvenated at a time when we're still under impairment. And, and I'll give you a second to look at all of them. And the ones in yellow are the ones that I think um, we can best address today. So I'll give you a, a second to look at that. So the two things that I want us to talk about is I want us to accept the reality that life is different. For some of you, you know it's different because you're in semester two of it being different. Um, but even a school district close to me, they've had, um, they've had half time, they've had a, a hybrid model, they've gone to all virtual, they're now coming back to hybrid. Uh, even if you've accepted life is different, life is still a new version of different from where it was before. And if you know me from before, you might think this is very strange advice for me to say expect less from yourself, uh, because I'm not a real expect less kind of person. In fact, I, I think I usually push people to do more. But I want us to think about what it means not to do stuff of lower quality, but to shrink the amount of stuff we're doing and focus on what really matters. And that's sort of the lens I want us to take into this next, this next sense. I feel like, and if you, if we've talked before, you know, I'm into this word impact. And I feel like one of the ways we can think about being, feeling successful and feeling productive at a hard time is for us to focus on impact as our measure. Not did we do the book fair and did we have a poet come and did the politician read for reading month, but what is the end goal of doing things? So that we take our attention away from the need to be busy and we really laser focus when our choices are limited, what are the things that matter the most? And the reason I can't give you a prescription for that is because everybody is different and every school is different, right? But I do think impact comes from priorities. And I think that when we are in a stressful period, it can be even harder to take the time out to think about, okay, really, what is really important this year? Is it cataloging? For some schools, yeah, getting a bunch of e-texts available is a high priority. In some schools that don't have an, an e-book um, transmission model, 
maybe cataloging weights a year. Um, so it's, it's a conversation we have to have with ourselves. And I think we have to ask ourselves a big question. One of the things that I think there's a tension around right now is, um, should we be advocating for our programs or should we, should we be advocating for the school? And uh, my instinct, and again, every school is different, is that we're sort of in an all hands on deck situation in this 11 month emergency we've been in. And maybe our greater impact can come from helping the school, but sort of sneaking our own stuff in there. And so we have to think too about impact on whom, where are we gonna put our focus? Is it to support the teachers so they have more bandwidth, better materials, better support that can then trickle down to the students? Is it that we directly need to be with the students? And what is it we're trying to impact? Are we trying to impact a sense of connectivity? Are we trying to impact um, one's ability to navigate a world of, of misinformation? Are we trying to impact the long-term health of our program? And so I can only offer the questions for you to be thinking about. And so I wanna ask you a second question. I don't want you to, I want you to think not of what are the biggest projects or biggest programs or biggest events that you have in a normal year. But like at the end of every year of, of mine working at U of M, I have to write about my impact. How did I change or influence the profession I work with? So I want you to do the same thing. If, if someone called your school and asked your principal, where does this person make the biggest difference? What would the answer to that question be? So that's your second question back over on this same URL. Guys, I'm loving the things that I'm seeing um, being written here. I'm gonna give it another minute. It looks like, and I keep looking down because that's where my phone is with my Google Doc open. Um, it looks like there's several categories of places where you're making an impact. For some people, it's about access to materials at a weird time. At some, so some it's the technology to access those e-resources. For some people, it's about making connections with students and parents. For some people, it's been district leadership empathy materials. I think that's so important in the fractious world we're living in. Teacher support, merely opening up the option for leisure reading. So what I see here is that you know what it is that you do that would be most missed if you took it away. And what I don't see here is like I dressed up like Clifford the dog. You know, things we would do in a normal year if you're in elementary that would just be fun. I'm seeing that you're focusing on 
core service areas service to teachers, service to students, um, service to family as well. Um, and I'll let you keep writing because I can see someone at the bottom who's writing something really good. Um, I want you to keep thinking about this as sort of this North Star, that when you get up and you're tired and your kid's in the next room going to online school, that your North Star is to get to this impact, right? And I think that that will help make it through the tough times. So I teach people also, uh, I teach librarianship to people and I always say like you have to have a reason to get up and sit at the desk in a library because uh, some days you're just going to get asked where the bathroom is all day and you need to know that you're there for a bigger reason than to be a human side, right? So keep those sort of ideas in mind. And if you set this activity out and said, I have no idea what my biggest impacts are in a normal year, now you have some ideas that you can think about, right? Because it's, I have a, a colleague who said every day I get up and I think about three things I'm going to get done today because I've realized I can only get three things done today in a pandemic. So helping to sculpt that back and also having the courage to say, I really love doing X, Y, and Z, but I realize that if I want to have impact, I'm going to have to put that to the side and save my energy for the things that matter most. Okay. Um, <laughs> This is an article that appeared in School Library Journal about what the profession is doing during um, during the pandemic. And it has this lovely poll quote. This photo is taken by my, my friend and colleague, Jeff Smith. And I was quoted as saying, we're split between the go-getters and I'm here when you need me, folks. This is the year for the go-getters. And I, the reason I say this is not that you should be like drumming up business all day, every day. But I think that most of the folks that we serve do not have the bandwidth to approach us proactively. I think in many more cases, what they have is if you could offer them a solution, they'd be happy to take it, but they may not have the bandwidth to be able to initiate that on their own. So if we just sit back and say, I'm here when you need me, I'm here when you need me, I'm here when you need me, by the end of the year, we're gonna feel frustrated we're going to feel like, how come nobody came to me? I feel bad. I don't like working in this school. Um, and we're generally going to feel negative. And remember, we have enough things to feel negative about right now, right? So I'm going to ask you um, to move to the next question. And that next question is this. I believe that school librarians see things that someone who spends their day in a single classroom might not see. That you have a bird's eye view over the, over the way in which your school is working, a, a view that would be easier to get um, in, uh, if you are in the building. But I think you see things distinct from what a principal sees, distinct from what the counselor sees, or distinct from what specials see. So what I wanna know is, what do you think your school community needs most right now? And what do you see that maybe no one else does? And as I'm seeing the answer, uh, the answers that are coming in for question three, I want you to actually take this, this view beyond the library. So not what does your school community need most from you right now, what do you see the community struggling with? So a much bigger issue than that. And it could be that, that what they need most is you and your stuff and your expertise. But it may not only be that. What are you hearing the students complain about, the parents complain about? I always think it's weird that I was a K-12 teacher and now I 
teach with faculty members who have kids and it's very weird to hear them talk about my old job. And I can say that like what they need is not to get so much email from school, for example. That would be an example of something to think about. I'm going to give you a couple more minutes because what you're what you're putting down here is fantastic. Keep it up. I told y'all we're doing better than you thought you were. It looks like things are are calming down a little bit. So, um, gosh, these are just beautiful responses. And you know, there's there's someone who wrote right up at the top that students need individual time, and I think that is phenomenally important because I do think that children's parents are also very distracted right now because they are juggling a, a complex world they never had to. Um, we've seen lots of parents who are like, how come the school decided that now I have to be tech support? I don't know what to do, I didn't ask for that. And so as parents also are juggling much more than they ever have before, we do see that in some cases, children aren't getting that one-on-one -on -one time, uh, particularly our students who are not in good shape, right? Um, I have like, I have some relatives who, and the kids are doing like phenomenally well. They love the structure. They love the time they have at home with their mom and dad. Their mom and dad have flexible schedules to support them during that time. And I know other families where it just feels like a never ending disaster, right? So um, you can give support to a single student or to five students at a time. You can say to, if you're in an elementary school, I'm just going to take five kids at a time and we're going to do fill in the blank with thing that you want to be working on with your students, right? Um, and maybe it's only a half an hour, May, but it's going to do two things. First, it's going to make you feel good because you're going to see that impact happening with the child. And secondly, the child is going to feel good. And the teacher is going to feel better because they just got to concentrate on a smaller group of kids while they teach something that's a little bit harder. Maybe you take half the kids. And again, as school librarians, I bet we heard in library school, you never want to be the sub for the building. I think this is a year where the way to get your program going might be to take time like that. And I'll bet you you'd have an ally in the school counselor, and I bet you'd have an ally in the school principal as well, who sees you as solving a problem. But meanwhile, you're just getting your curriculum covered. Um, it definitely looks like there is a need for a sense of community, a safe place for healing, and um, strategies to make distant learning students more successful at home. You know, one of the things that I found so weird about all the advice about online learning is how much of it is, has to do with the invasion of school into the home. How we see stuff in, our, in the backgrounds of our students that we never saw before and how invasive that can feel. And all of the rules we set. You can't be on your sofa, you can't be in your bed, you can't wear pajama pants, you better brush your teeth, your hair better be combed. Um, some of these rules didn't even apply when we were face to face. And as my niece said once, like, what are you going to do? Knock on the door and smell my breath. Um, <laughs> so she's a very nice girl. Um, so something, so I'm, I'm definitely seeing things that lift people's spirits, points of connectivity. This is why in public libraries, take home craft kits have been one of the, the hit pieces of programming. So what's the public, what's the school library 
version about that. Definitely some need for standardization. So what we saw um, under the previous presidential administration was like, good luck states figuring this out for yourself and good luck schools figuring it out for yourself. And even some of the, the regulations had that, um, or the guidance that had been set forth was actually pulled. Um, so there was a sense always that somebody maybe knew something that we didn't. Um, so I, I, I'm hopeful that there might be more guidance coming forward or that it will be more standardized. I also know that in a lot of schools, what we're seeing is like one parent begging you to have the kids full time all day, every day, and the next parent saying, don't you dare get my kids sick by making them come to school all day, every day. So we have that tension as well. Um, I think this idea of being free of fear is a really beautiful um, sense, a place that you can feel safe. And we also want to acknowledge in saying that, that um, some students feel more safe in a library than others do, right? Um, so we want to be careful about not just knee-jerk assuming that everybody loves the library as much as we do. Um, I see stability, a safe place to relax and read. Um, equipping families, really thinking about the fact that the social service needs of your community may be quite different. And always when we are in an economic distress situation like this, that there are people who never thought they would need help who need help. Um, these are all just spectacular, you guys. Um, I see things about choice. I see that you're seeing that, that there's a need for this sort of third space. It's not quite home, it's not quite school. Maybe it's the library. And maybe it's fun. Maybe you're holding trivia night, but also maybe it's just a time to be deeply immersed into something and to feel the pleasure that comes from that. Uh, I don't know how you guys are feeling about, um, about your sense of, of energy these days, but it is harder for me to concentrate than it used to be. And when I have like a whole like, hour, and I can just sink into my work. The pleasure that comes from that is fantastic. Um, so I, I feel good about where you are and the kinds of things that you are thinking about and the ways in which that's creating that sort of North Star um, for you that we've mentioned before. So here's some things that I pre-wrote, <laughs> much of which I think you will see. Um, I think that I, I sort of see three categories. Like many of you, I see that there is a real socio-emotional issue going on. Um, first, those basic needs. I think people don't feel heard. I think they don't feel centered. I think there are very few people reassuring them. Um, one of the things I noticed when, because um, I was doing a lot of work at the early part of the shutdown with public librarians, they were just beside themselves that they could not be helpful that that had always been an important role for themselves. I think we have to get to the heart of the fact that we're living in a world of pretty deep and pretty sophisticated misinformation where people are making some pretty big decisions based on some bad information. I think that we are tired of the political heat and the political rhetoric. I think that was part of what made yesterday feel good even though Today, we're kind of back to that fractiousness. It was a pause. It was a national pause from some of that fighting. I also agree that people need stuff to self, I always can't say this word, self-soothe with, and um, both the materials to do it and the means to do it. And when I was doing more work with makerspaces, remember when we did that, because we could be near each other, um, I found that self-soothing activities were some of the most popular ones that people gravitated to, that they didn't always see maker time as, as a desire to build up their skills so much as like listen to their own drummer a little bit. And I think the other thing we're seeing is like someone just take something off my plate, please or some acknowledgement, like this isn't normal. Why are we having standardized tests when it's not normal? I see a second need, which is that teachers in the classroom, um, it takes so much more time to teach online than it does to teach face-to-face, -face, right? When you can just walk to the file cabinet and get out your sponge activity, and that's harder to do, um, both for your classes online and for students. So I think too, Anything we can do to, to, to winnow down resources into a small number of little jewels 
that are all set to be deployed online. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about next time some more. And that's the place where I think we can have that secret mission of maybe I offer to get like a social studies unit pulled together for them. And oh, by the way, maybe it'll have some information literacy skills built into it. So I still get the stuff done for me and things go on for them. I also want to talk about, um, and, and I'm going to do this knowing that this may sound political to some people. I like democracy. So I think one of the challenges we're having is that we are not encouraging fact checking across the ide ideological spectrum. Is that we tend to be looking in this sort of column format that we tend to get a bunch of news sources that fall into one. And we're seeing more extremes of that as we go. I'm also very concerned that um, something I used to say as a librarian all the time doesn't mean what it used to. And that is the sort of QAnon um, technological sort of cult that says, you need to find out the truth for yourself. You need to research it for yourself. And suddenly the language we used to use to mean one thing is starting to mean something much different that has much more serious consequences. And I think that we need some so we need to go back to figuring out how to talk about fact and opinion from an early age in a way that is more nuanced. So I've stuck these charts in here. We used to say, oh, it's just enough, like as long as you check in two or three sources, then it, we can say it's true. But what we've learned in the past four years is that like Washington Post puts out a story and then the New York Times puts out a story saying according to the Washington Post, and then like Vox says, according to the New York Times and the Washington Post, and we have three sources, but they're really all reporting from one source. And so we wanna think about spreading out those resources some more. And at a time when you have more um, time, I hope that you'll access this deck and take a look at these ways of representing the, the media ecosystem, because um, the place that I think we really want to be looking is, are we showing a broad diet in this green rectangle on the left, the very top section? Are we, uh, because that's when the news, where the news is, the yellow box shows us um, folks who talk about the news across the spectrum, liberal to conservative. The orange and the red triangles where we need to be the most concerned, because that's where things may be written that have the intent to damage discourse or unfairly pursue things. I want people to vote however they want to vote. I am concerned that our, that our information ecosystem is very quickly being poisoned and people are becoming unable to make that choice for themselves. For those of you in more conservative communities, this is from, um, a Pew journalism study. This goes back to 2014. And all the way back in 2014, one of the things they found is that um, folks on the liberal end of the spectrum tend to read or view across a variety of sources. But there is, and I would say really up till about January 6th, there was really one dominant conservative newspaper and that, or conservative news outlet. And it's risky anytime we put all our chickens in one uh, are all our eggs in one basket? All our anyway, uh, so we might want to think about how do we introduce sources. I was stunned to realize that USA Today is actually seen as one of the more neutral sources. If you don't have a subscription to that or you're not using it as a way of looking at current events, same with Christian Science Monitor, same with BBC, there might be some advantage in really thinking, especially for those of you from high school and middle school, about introducing other sources as a matter of practice. Um, I know when I go to rural or conservative parts of my state, Fox News is on everywhere. It's at the grocery store, it's at the dentist, it's at the gas station, it's in the Tim Hortons. Um, and so thinking about how we broaden perspectives for folks could have a really important lower class D uh, democratic impact. I also want to make sure you know about these new media literacy standards that came out earlier this week. I think they came out on Tuesday. Um, Rand Corporation a few years ago did a report on what they called truth decay. 
And they've uh, just published a set of media literacy standards. And as you look at them, you're gonna be like, oh yeah, this is what we've been teaching for years in information literacy. So with Biden having made this statement about misinformation in the inaugural address, you have an opportunity now to open up this discussion um, with your principal or to say, I think we need to work on this as part of our civics education, part of social studies, and to really be the building leader for something like that. And again, what we want is for our students to be, have strong abilities to parse arguments so they make the democratic choice that they think they're making. Okay, so those are some things that I feel like I'm seeing. And my hypothesis is that we can embed um, our priorities if we think about how we approach our stakeholders' needs. And someone has their hand up, Dina. Um, you know what? I wonder if the Cherry Lake folks could turn on the chat and see if we could get the questions that way. Is that possible? The chat is on. We have the webinar chat going if they you want to do. drop a question in there okay. or you can um, privately message it to me or to Kristen. Okay. And for some reason, this happened to me yesterday. My chat is not showing up. My chat oh, Dina said she didn't mean to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay. So I want us to also think about stakeholders. And um, by the way, do you guys know these illustrations from blackillustrations.com? They're super great if you want to diversify your images. Um, I've been thinking a lot about how to get what I want by appealing to what people need. And so I want to propose some things that we think about broadly, not talking about any specific teacher, but really stopping to say, okay, what's the issue? Teachers don't have time. Everything takes longer. Transitioning to digital is hard. Technology is hard. Dealing with parents is harder because there's so many diverse perspectives of what they want. Not to mention that it's literally more expensive to work from home, right? Has anybody had their water bill or their utility bill go way up? So I think that's a piece of the puzzle. So I'm thinking if I want to have more of an influence in my school and I want to flex that impact, those are some of the challenges I want to think about connecting to and addressing. So I also want to think about these sort of values. Teachers tend to like consistency. They tend to like routine, especially if they're on an every other day hybrid face-to-face -face schedule. So me stepping into their classroom might disrupt that sense of routine, right? They want to feel competent, so maybe I'm going to have some luck um, doing some one-on-ones with them. And I also think that one of the best strategies we might have as a school librarian is to simply say, can I take the kids off your, hand for, your hands for half an hour? You teach what you've been meaning to teach. They get the break they need to call the parents, plan the lesson, or take on some of that other stuff. So again, I know I'm challenging that idea that um, we don't want to be considered subs. I just think we're like in the trenches now and our rules might need to change a little. Um, and I also know that as a university person, if I have to be away from class, I might ask the librarian assigned to my school if they can teach that day. And I don't do it because I need a sub and I'm copping out and I don't respect the librarian. Now that I'm on the other side of things, I ask the librarian to do that because I know they'll do a good job. I know that they, as a librarian themselves, can teach librarians something important. So don't think when you're asked this, I think we've gotten a little bit too sensitive about um, how dare they ask me to do that. So they don't necessarily want to co-plan right now. They can't afford the time to do that. It's not about you. They want a very small set of resources, not a big set. And um, they might not want to hear about, like, wouldn't it be fun if? Um, maybe oh, that sounds fun if you'll just take the kids for a while, but, um, but really, like, if they don't have time to do the fun stuff, they might not want you to do it. And they don't want to hear that you have a curriculum, too. So thinking about how we can get to teachers. Similar with principals, and I see I'm, I'm starting to get into my last five minutes of time. 
they are just trying to keep the whole thing from falling apart, right? Like they're just running around with duct tape all the time. And um, they're battling the, a staffing problem. In fact, a district near Ann Arbor basically said to parents, I know you want school to come open and I literally don't have enough healthy bodies to do it right now. Um, and then he closed with a very nice idea that maybe you wanted to stay home over the holidays, right? So they're also dealing with extraordinary public health needs and they didn't get any money to do it. And what do principals like? They want you to get along and not whine. Uh, they care about student achievement. They don't want to put out fires. They want to brag about cool stuff, so make sure you tell them when you do it. And they don't want to hear that they suck because they don't have flexible schedule. And they don't want to hear that you only care about the library and not the school or the students. And they don't want to get between you all. So try to stay on their good side. And from a family perspective, you've already articulated uh, a piece of this puzzle. Um, the things that I will actually turn on and oh gosh, looks like it got a little covered up um, when the slides shrunk down. I just want to focus kind of on the turnoffs. Do be aware that one of the challenges we're dealing with in low income communities is that as hard as it is to be a teacher, and I include librarians in this, you have it so good by comparison. So they don't always have a ton of sympathy because they're like, at least you get health insurance or at least you get retirement. Um, and so some of that historic parental support for teachers, um, we had a short honeymoon in March, April, May when they were like, wow, you teachers work really hard. And now they're kind of back to this. So we're living in a different um, political reality. I think there's some pushback that they are being told that teachers are going to decide what happens in their home. And um, I think that they resent being asked to pick up for what schools can't do, and they don't want to feel judged. And I think they feel like you feel, and I feel, which is like, I am doing the best I can to get through the day. Okay, so I think, because uh, I want to make sure we have enough time, that one of the things we want to think about is that a way forward, a way to that impact, is to think about how we package the things we want to do anyway. And then we want to package it in such a way that the stakeholders want to hear it. So you want to do a research project, can you make it about giving them time, for example? And it also means that we really need to think for, and I'm thinking about all the notes that you guys left earlier, that they are craving relationships as much as you are. And this might be a time where we have a little bit more ease in our schedule to pitch in and not to keep close score of who's being fair or not fair. Okay, so again, here's the advice we were trying to address. Accepting that life is different, we cannot do what we always did before, and we're gonna expect less of ourselves by focusing on the things that are really important. So what I hope that we will do next time is think about what does it look like to bundle up some resources for teachers that also carry underneath them our priorities, and I'll have some ideas and I will be eager to hear yours as well since you've shown your hand at uh, the great ideas that you've already brought. But in the meantime, I am super excited um, at some of the things that Cherry Lake has come out um, with this year. And since they are the sponsors of this, they get the last few minutes. I particularly want to do a shout out though in advance to the social justice work that they have done in their publishing because I feel like there's a hole in people's collections and they stepped in at a fractious time and said, oh, okay, Kristen, we'll, do you think we should do something about pre-release brutality? Okay, we'll do it. Uh, and so uh, I'm really excited that you guys get to see that shown off. So I'm gonna log, I'm gonna close out for now, but I'll keep an eye out for your questions and answers while Caitlin is talking. Thanks guys. Hi everybody, how's it going? I am Caitlin. I am one of the editor, editors at Cherry Lake Press. Um, as Kristen said, I'm gonna be sharing with you guys some of the titles that we're super excited about that have just released. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right into this. I'm gonna start with the Together We Can pandemic series. 
Um, so the COVID-19 pandemic introduced many changes into children's lives from changes at school to social gatherings. Kids are being asked to carry a pretty heavy burden. Um, so books in this series address those changes as well as suggest um, different ways for kids to cope and adapt. And while we hope COVID will be over sooner rather than later, this series will help readers continue to manage these new lifestyles. And as you can see, we've got some titles like Learning at Home, Celebrating Virtually, and my favorite, Finding the Helpers. Our next series is called Protest March for Change. This series covers some of the most famous marches in modern US history, including the March on Washington and the Black Lives Matter protest of 2020. So this series gives historical context to these protests and also empowers children to show them that their voice can make a difference. So these heavy topics are handled in age appropriate ways because as we know, many of these topics are impacting our readers directly. As you can see from our titles like the Climate March, March for Our Lives, and the 2020 Black Lives Matter movement. So our next series here is Racial Justice in America. So race is a topic in education that has been avoided uh, for far too long. So this series explores the topic in a comprehensive, honest, and age-appropriate way. This was developed in conjunction with educator, advocate, and author Kalisa Wing to reach children of all races and to encourage them to approach race issues with open eyes and open minds. So each book in this series features teaching tolerances, social justice standards, uh, which is a framework for anti-bias education. So we've got some great heavy hitter titles here, like what is anti-racism? What is white privilege? What does it mean to defund the police? So both this series and our March for Change series are titles that we're super proud of. So we've rebound them and adapted them into a 48 page a trade picture book as a part of our Sleeping Bear Press learning initiative. And then to move on to our Sleeping Bear Press titles, first up we have June Almeida, Virus Detective. So this is the true story of the woman who discovered the first human coronavirus in 1964. Her groundbreaking work continues to help researchers today in the fight against illnesses caused by viruses, including COVID-19. So apart from this being a great uh, biography about a little known female scientist, the takeaway of this book is a message of comfort and encouragement. There have been and will always continue to be scientific, environmental, and healthcare challenges facing our world today, but there are always experts working behind the scenes for answers and for cures. So our next title I thought would play well to our audience today, this is The Lady of the Library. So a ghostly lady haunts her local library, but when the library is scheduled for demolition, she wonders if her days of haunting are over. So she teams up with a young girl and they work together with their community to save their beloved library. So this is a lovely celebration of public libraries and a timely reminder of the important role they play in their communities. And to close out today, I have a teacher like you so teachers are always important, but um, during the COVID-19 pandemic crisis that we're in, they've been tasked with a Herculean job of keeping students engaged virtually or safe in person. If there's any year to thank a teacher, it's this year. So a teacher like you is a loving tribute to the educators everywhere, thanking them for all the countless ways they encourage and support and care for their students and just reassuring them that their impact is felt and it's going to continue to be felt for many years to come. So what I love about this book is it celebrates all the everyday teachers that includes parents, coaches, and librarians alike. Um, so that's all for me today, everybody. Again, I hope some of these titles brought a smile to your face um, and thank you so much for your time today. And I will just hop on here to wrap things up. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Again, as a reminder, our next webinar, another free webinar for librarians will be on February 18th. I did put the registration link into the chat box, so please register if you're interested. The third one will be on March 18th, so easy enough to remember, same time, 4 to 5 p.m. for both the upcoming webinars. Again, registration link is in the chat box. We will also be following up with an email if any of these books look interesting to you, or if you want more information, I'll send all of that in an email that will go out to all 
registrants. We're also still doing a giveaway as advertised for everyone that registered. So we'll be selecting winners for some great uh, giveaways, including Amazon gift cards, book bundles, fun things like that from us. Um, I want to thank both Kristen and Caitlin for coming on and presenting today. And I also want to, again, thank all of the librarians. We know your schedules are crazy. We know that everyone has Zoom drain going on these days. So we appreciate you taking that extra bit of time today to join us. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, you know, you can leave final questions in the chat box right now, um, or don't hesitate to reach out to us um, via email or uh, check out our website for resources. We're on social media. Uh, make sure you give us a follow if you are as well. And I think that covers it. Anything, any final words, Kristen? I would just add that you had Matthew Kapiar's um, contact information. He's mm -hmm. one of the field reps. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to, to stop and say, he is a wonderful resource. If you are a new librarian, or you want to talk to someone who can tell you sort of the beat of what's happening, I try to have that conversation with Matthew about once a year, because he's really observant. He's a good listener to what you need, and he can often um, kind of bring you perspectives that you might not have seen in your own, in your own library. So just a shout out to Matthew. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and I saw a few people were asking for links for the books. Again, I will email that out afterwards so everyone has access to everything that Caitlin went over. I'm also going to try and get Kristen's presentation available to everyone that wants to see it. This is also a recorded Zoom, so we will get it online on our website and email that out. We're trying to give you as many resources from this as we possibly can. Um, so keep an eye out for the email. It will come from our Cherry Lake Publishing Group email account. Uh, thank you, everyone. Stay safe. And uh, we're so grateful that you joined us this afternoon. Take care. Keep fighting the good fight, guys. Bye. <laughs>